Good morning. I hope all you're doing, all of you are doing well this morning. It's good to see you this morning. And uh, I know there's a lot of uh, unrest in our country right now. I was reading about that and seeing all the stuff that's happening this week as well. Um, we are not, you know, when I'm looking at, at, at where we're at, we're, we are definitely not in the place where I think God has called us. We, see, we seem to be stuck right now. And um, I'm with you. My heart is hurting today. Continue to be saddened. Uh, we, we have a long way to go. Um, but I'm glad you're here. And uh, we're going to share God's word today. But before I do, I want to remind you at the, at the end of our, um, of our service today, we're going to have communion. So I hope you have it at home. If you have some, some uh, communion elements, uh, get some juice or some substitutes if you have have any and some bread, that would be great. We'll close our, our, our message today with communion. And so um, good to see you guys today. I want to share this with you. Um, when I'm looking about at all the, uh, the demonstrations that are happening around the country, all the, uh, uh, you know, not so much the, the riots anymore, but, but even though there's, there's a lot of unrest going on there, um, there's a difference between the peaceful demonstrations and the riots. And uh, peaceful demonstrations are, are okay, but the riots are not. And uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, mayors and public officials that are, they're all trying to make decisions and, and some of them seem impulsive. Some of them just seem, seem like there's just new laws, new decisions, new restriction, restrictions going on. And, and I know it's a tough position, so we always need to be praying for our, for our officials because uh, one decision may please a, a certain group of people, and it, but it may offend another group of people. And so it's a hard job. Um, but here's, here's what I would share with you today, or one of the things I, I, I know is that, you know, when Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, he was a man who loved the Lord. He was a man who loved the Lord. He, he, served, he served the Lord, and he had a dream, a dream birthed from his faith in Jesus Christ that there would come a day when his children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He, had, he said this in his I Had a Dream speech. He believed he had a conviction that people of every color, every tongue, every tribe, every nation should be able to enjoy the freedoms endowed in every human being as created in the image of God. And uh, he also paid a price for his dream, what he believed in and what he fought for with his life. And his legacy uh, uh, has seen many anti-discrimination laws passed over the years in America, um, laws uh, impacting our schools, our, our public venues, our public places, our workplaces, and there's still much left to do. You can, you can see it in society today. In fact, more laws will probably be passed to deal with uh, the riots and racism, the looting, the things we see manifest right now in our country. But understand this. I, I would share with you, with, uh, this with you. I would offer this to you today that, um, that, the law, the, that the law cannot fundamentally, laws cannot fundamentally change the heart of a, of a society entrenched in, entrenched in racism. Our anti-discrimination uh, anti laws they may set standards for how we as Americans are supposed to treat all people equally and fairly, um, but laws don't have the power to change a person's heart. They just don't, much less a society entrenched in racism. They don't have the power to do that. Only God can give America a new heart and put a new spirit in them. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. It was, it was, in, it, it was in his mercy, it was, it was in his mercy that, that God poured out his spirit upon his people over 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. This is what God did in the lives of those present on the day of Pentecost. He, he gave them a new heart. He gave them a new heart, put a new spirit in them. 2,000 years ago, devout Jewish people and, um, and Gentile converts from all over the world, they, they, they made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It was for the festival of Pentecost. And understand that it, would, it was a society entrenched in, um, in racism, hatred, slavery. Um, but on Mount Sinai, God would set a people apart from himself um, by giving them the law, people from whom a savior would be born to bring reconciliation to all people. This was the mission of Jesus. It was a, it was a mission of, of mercy. Um, but on this day, 50 days, uh, 50 days, after the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, 10 days after his ascension into heaven where he would take his, his seat in the place of honor at God's right hand, um, 
He would pour out, he would, he would pour out on this day the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, um, you know, Jesus was telling his disciples in, in the first chapter of, of, of Acts that it's not, a, it's not up for you to know, it's not for you to know the times that the, uh, of the kingdom that the Father himself has set, but he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. You will receive power. I'm not giving you the law. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You gotta see on the day of Pentecost, Jesus' disciples were empowered for a mission of mercy. God called them. He empowered them for a high and holy purpose, a mission of mercy. In Christ, they had received mercy. And now on the day of Pentecost, they they were empowered by the Holy Spirit so that they would be able to share mercy. Understand in his mercy, God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. In his mercy, God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. In his mercy, God did for his disciples on the day of Pentecost something that they could never achieve on their own. He gave them life and power to enter a world entrenched in racism. I'm going to say that again. He gave them life. He gave them power, the power to enter into a world entrenched in, in racism with a vision of where history was headed. You see, Jesus had been already been pouring into his disciples, and, and on that day, he gave them a vision of where, of where history was headed. On that day, when, when they were gathered together and, and, and there was a supernatural power poured out in his disciples, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as, as the Spirit of God was giving them utterance. It was literally a picture of what the future was going to look, look like in the book of Revelation where it says that one day, um, one day there will be people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation coming together as one in relationship with God, offering praises, worshiping God. This is what it's going to look like when it all comes together. And they, they, and they were now, his disciples were now empowered to enter into this, this society entrenched in racism to bring, uh, to, to give expression to the mercy that they had received from Christ. Now, Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. He was one of, one of the 12 that followed Jesus. And if there's anyone who knew mercy um, like anything else, it was Matthew. Perhaps his, his greatest contribution for the kingdom as a result of Pentecost coming upon his life was the writing of his gospel, the writing of the book of Matthew. If there was anyone who knew about mercy, it was Matthew, because it is a book about, about mercy. It was written for, uh, Matthew wrote his book, it was written for a, a Greek Jewish audience, and it includes a lot of Old Testament promises, uh, mainly because Matthew wanted to show his audience, to show his audience that God had kept his promises to Israel through the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The setting of the scripture I want to share with you today, it's, it's in Matthew chapter 9. You can, you can take your Bible there, turn to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to pick it up in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And the setting here is that um, this particular event takes place in Capernaum. It is a, it is a village on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, um, along the northeast, bo northeast border of Israel. And Matthew here is literally describing how God called him, how God called him from his old life and into a new life uh, in fellowship with Jesus. And understand Matthew is a tax collector for the Roman government. He's, he's literally border patrol. He's a customs agent. And most people in the Roman Empire did not like tax collectors. Um, Jewish people actually viewed them as traitors. Um, and, and these tax collectors, they, they, they affected the poor most, uh, most dramatically. It wouldn't have been unheard of. It wasn't unheard of when, that, that when harvests were bad in Egypt, the population of an entire village, it wasn't unheard of where the, where the population of an, of an entire village would leave and start a village somewhere once they heard that the tax collector was coming. They were hated. Tax collectors were hated. And so um, in Capernaum, again, we find Matthew. He's, he's probably a customs agent. He's, he's border patrol. They char he's charging tariffs on goods passing through the country. And like other tax collectors or border patrol, they, they could search possessions. They could go through all your stuff. If you're passing through, they're going to search everything. They're going to go through all your stuff. 
um, with income going to the local governments run by the elite class of people who were cooperative with the Roman Empire. This was Matthew's vocation. This was his job. Um, nobody liked tax collectors. They were known for being crooked. They were known for being liars, thieves, people who abused their position and power to fill their own pockets. Now, what makes this worse is that Matthew is Jewish. His real name is actually Levi. Now, understand this. Matthew is actually the English name for Levi, which means uh, joint or coiler or adhesion. You see, in Old Testament times, the Levites, they were a tribe of, of Israel. Uh, the Levites were the priests. They were the people who promoted social, social cohesion. They had no land of their own, but were dispersed among the tribes of Israel, infusing all of them equally with the same religious expressions and thus forging a unified national identity across all the clans. Um, they, they were there to promote social cohesion. But here we find Matthew in a vocation of not bringing people together, but actually bringing division to his people, um, being a facilitator of hatred, racism, not helping his people, but actually exploiting them. As Jesus was walking along, the scripture tells us that um, in Matthew 9, 9, that he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his collector's booth. Now, what caught my attention as we were listening to this, I mean, again, this is Matthew now. He's writing his gospel. It's after the day of Pentecost, one of his greatest contributions after he was filled with the Spirit, empowered to bring a, me a, a message of mercy into an, a, a society entrenched in, in, in hatred, racism, slavery. He's, he's sitting at his, at his tax collector's booth. Now, what caught my attention was the fact that he's sitting. They're not going to be sitting. They're going to be searching people's possessions. They were going to be searching um, people who are passing through. He should have been searching Jesus, making him empty your pockets. Um, but the Lord found him sitting there. I, I wonder in that moment if, if Matthew was fed up, if maybe in that moment Matthew had come to a place where he realized, I'm... I'm where I shouldn't be. Um, I don't know if, it, if, if he had had enough, but, but he wasn't, he, in that moment, he wasn't searching for possessions. He saw himself perhaps stuck in a job, stuck in a place of life, hated by his Jewish community, a place he could never get himself out of. Maybe when Jesus was walking up and he saw him sitting there, he saw a man, he saw, he saw a man who was not where he was supposed to be. He was not the man who, who, he, who he was supposed to be. And so how did Jesus speak to this tax collector who was sitting at his table? Jesus says this. He says, follow me and be my disciple. So Matthew, without hesitation, he got up and followed him, the scripture tells us. Verse 10 says that later Matthew invited, he invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guest. And along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees, the religious leaders, when they saw this, they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Such scum. I mean, this is how the Pharisees looked upon uh, Matthew, his vocation, the riffraff. I mean, Matthew having been uh, ostracized from his Jewish community. I mean, his only friends were, were tax collectors, were sinners, were the people who, who, were, who, who were the disreputable people in the society. They were considered the riffraff. And so Matthew, having experienced God's mercy in his own life, the only way he could respond to follow Jesus is, I just need to invite my friends, and these are my friends. It is what it is. These are my friends, the riffraff of society. I'm going to invite them to my home. And I'm going to invite Jesus to be there. Matthew, understand, the mercy was so great in Matthew's life. What Jesus did to him was so great. The only way Matthew could find expression for the mercy that had been shown to him was to create a venue in which mercy could be shown to others. Immediately after following Jesus, he began to impact society by a simple dinner. He says, you know what, I, I can't change everyone, but I, I can, maybe I can facilitate change. I can't change a person's heart, but I can invite, I can create a setting where people can have an encounter with the one who showed me mercy. And maybe they can find mercy too. 
maybe they can find mercy too. And understand, these things impact society. These things, the laws, new laws, even anti-discrimination laws, they can't change a person's heart. Only Jesus can. Only the Holy Spirit can. G Matthew here is giving expression to the mercy that had been shown to him. Matthew had experienced mercy. These were his friends. He was literally giving expression to the mercy Jesus had shown him, trying to, to now become that Levite, trying to become living up to his name, a person who, who was supposed to be promoting social cohesion, social cohesion, not bringing division to it. Verse 12 says that when Jesus heard this from the Pharisees, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. They are sinners. When Jesus entered into Matthew's life, understand it was, it was, a, it was a mission. It was a mission of mercy. Christ did for Matthew what he could never do for himself. That's what mercy is. When Christ, when we find ourselves in a place where we're so stuck and we can't do anything about it. In fact, the only way to get unstuck is through the help of someone else. And Christ did for Matthew. Matthew found himself in a place that he could not get himself out of. He was stuck. And Christ did for him what he could never do for himself. I remember one time as, as uh, in grade school, we had, uh, our family had gone up to Yosemite in California, and it was one of our favorite vacation spots. And I was a pretty good swimmer, uh, but one of my favorite things I loved doing in Yosemite was they had they you know they had a little creek there, a little river there, and I loved getting on on my raft and, and flowing down the river. Um, and it was it was it was you know the river wasn't that deep, maybe a couple feet of water. But I remember one particular time I was on the raft again. I was I felt I was a good swimmer. I was on my on the raft. I was going up and down. I I'd go down the raft, come back up again, grab my raft, walk back up the, the riverbed, get on the raft. But then, but then one, uh, one particular time I was going down the river, I'd done this a lot of times, um, and I remember on the raft, there was a little two-foot dip. And for some reason, I was stricken with fear. I was afraid I was gonna flip over. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I mean, there was a fear that came over me that, shoot, this is, I don't wanna go over this little dip here. And, and so when I hit it, I, I went over the dip and I was holding onto the raft. I kind of held on the raft. I held on the rock because I didn't want to go any farther. And I was stricken with fear. I mean, if I would have let go, I mean, the water was not that deep. It was only a couple of feet deep. I would not have drowned, but I was so scared. I was holding onto the rock. I didn't know what to do. I was holding onto a raft. I didn't want to lose my raft and I didn't want to, I just could not let go of the rock. And at the whole time, the water was just, it, the water wouldn't stop. It was coming over me, coming over me. And I, and I was like, hell. And, I was, and, and literally, I remember in that moment, even though, I, even though I knew I wouldn't, even though I wouldn't have died, the fear felt like I was going to die. But I remember in that moment, a complete stranger saw me and he, he came over, just stepped into his foot, grabbed my hand and pulled me out. And he did for me what I, did, what I could not do for myself. In that time, I was so stricken with fear. I was, I was paralyzed and he did for me what I could not do for myself. That's, that's, that's an act of mercy. When, when we can enter into humanity and, and help people and, and do something for people that they cannot do for themselves. A lot of us, many people, I mean, all of us have, have experience. All of us, all of us have a past that has shaped who we are today, and some of that past is not very pretty. In fact, it's very messy. There's sometimes feelings we can't shake off, experiences that, that maybe happened 20, 30 years ago for some people, yet, yet to think about them, that for them, some of those feelings feel like it just happened yesterday. And, and, and you can't, it's something you can't change. It's the spirit who comes and, and does a work in our lives that helps us to do that, that helps us to be able to, um, to be that person God has called us to be, help us to live life the way Jesus lived his life. You see, when Jesus entered into Matthew's life, Jesus was literally, it was, it was a mission of mercy. It was a mission of mercy. Christ did for him what he could never do for himself. He could never do for himself. 
Again, many of us today, I think, especially in society, we can, we can relate to Matthew. Uh, he, knew he, was a, he knew he was in a place, a place in life he wasn't supposed to be. There, there was literally a gap, a great chasm between where he was at and where he knew God was calling him to be. I believe there's a great chasm right now in society between where we're at and, and the kind of society we're supposed to be. We're, we're just not there. We're, there. There's a great chasm between where we're at, where we're at right now as, as Americans, as citizens, and the way we relate to each other. There's a great chasm between where we're at now and the kind of society God has called us to be. And new anti-discrimination laws would not be enough. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Only God can change a person's heart. Only God can change a person. You can put in new laws and you can try to say, this is the way we're gonna treat people, but it doesn't eliminate perhaps years of racism that builds in. Only God can change that person's heart. And so we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need, we need as a society, we need to discover once again uh, the power of living in God's presence and let his spirit change that heart. Let his spirit change that heart. I remember one time we were um, youth pastors in, in, in La Mesa and, and there was a special time where, where the spirit had, had, had entered our, uh, our service. I remember we were worshiping, it was a Sunday night and, and the spirit fell in a special way. Um, it fell in a special way. And I remember seeing, seeing people come to the altar. And I remember seeing families who had um, perhaps um, uh, at odds with each other. Or people in the church didn't like each other. But for some reason, I don't know all the stories, but I know, I know this person did this to this person, or this person did that to that person. But in the moment that the spirit fell, I see these families, I see people who, come, who are coming together, didn't have a, a great uh, deal of, of, of like for each other. In that moment, in that moment, God was doing something supernatural in the hearts. And I see them at the altar, hugging each other, making, making amends, and, and seeing God do a supernatural work that, that no anti-discrimination law could have ever done. Because God was working in their heart. If we put energy in just getting people back to church, I mean, I, I think the very thing we're doing by keeping our churches closed is the very thing we actually need um, for our society. Excuse me for one second here. I'm back, sorry for that interruption. But the very thing, let me get back, the very thing that, that we need um, when I, it's, it's terrible when I think about how there are restrictions right now. Um, I know restrictions are loosening, but the very fact that we close churches is the, it, it, it's, it, I don't understand. I mean, I understand the pandemic, but we need to get our churches back reopened. We're here in Multnomah County and, and we're one of the last counties to, to, to get to, to apply, um, to get into phase one, to get into phase one of reopening our church. Our churches need to open. People need to get to a place where they can discover the power of God's presence and see God work into people's hearts again. We need to start worshiping. We need to reopen churches. New laws, new demonstrations, new riots. We need to get people into church. We need to, we need to get people into experiencing the power and presence of God. This is where hearts are gonna change. If we really wanna deal with racism, we need to create that place. We need to create that space where people can experience the power, discover the power of living in God's presence. This is where God's gonna deal with the heart, with the heart, with the root of the problem because there is a giant chasm. There is, there is a gap between where we're at and where we're supposed to be, where God has called us as people, where we're supposed to be, where we're supposed to be. I think about those two words that Jesus said to Matthew. They're probably the most Two power-filled words anyone could ever hear. They, those power-filled words um, have been changing people's lives ever since Jesus first uttered them over 2,000 years ago when he spoke into Matthew's uh, predicament. He said two words. He said, follow me. Follow me. What if every single American heard those words and responded? 
follow me. Follow me. Could that root out racism? Could that possibly root out all this racism? I believe it could. We need to have the power to proclaim to a society that says justice has been served on the cross. You may have a problem with this person, but I'm here to proclaim, not for my glory, but for his glory, um, the message that God has given me to share with you is that justice has been served. Justice was served on the cross. Jesus took a whooping for all my sins. He took a whooping for all of your sins. And as we're out there looking for justice, we need to keep in mind as followers of Christ that justice has been served. We have a message to proclaim and, and knowing that justice has been served actually opens the door for this mission of mercy, for reconciliation to happen. Justice has been served. God wants to give us the power to proclaim that justice has been served on the cross. Well, pastor, you don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what this person has been to me. And I, I know there's a lot I don't understand. All I know is, I, is, is, I, uh, is that I, I believe regard, of all the problems in the world that our solution can be found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because I know the vision he's given me of where history is headed. I know that one day that no matter how far off we've gotten that, that through Jesus Christ we can bridge this chasm from where we're at and get to the place that God has called us to be. That it has to happen through his mercy. Through his mercy. It's... It's, it, we've got to understand that the chief, the chief characteristic of, of the messianic kingdom, of the kingdom that is coming, is the promise of forgiveness. That is the chief character, characteristic. It is the mercy. It's the promise, of, the promise of forgiveness. A year of jubilee, an age of new and fresh beginnings. It's encountering the mercy of God and, and, and learning how to give expression to that mercy by being merciful to others. Justice has been served. It's learning how to how to find joy in the fact that, that the Father has forgiven an unpayable debt so his followers can also forgive the wrongdoings of those who have trespassed against them. Justice was served on the cross. Justice was served on the cross. Pentecost is a work of mercy, and mercy is the product of one who has discovered the joy of forgiveness. Joy of forgiveness. Are, today, are you, are you carrying the burden of, of guilt, shame, regrets, things that perhaps have, you've done, you've said, or you've done, and, and you wish you could take back. You see, our wrongdoing has a toll. Every time we, 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 we do things that we know are wrong, we, 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 have, we, we put something in our backpack that makes life a little bit more heavy. And only Jesus can, can lighten that load. Only Jesus can... The, the justice that was served on the cross, only he can set us free from this burden. He is the one that promises, I can give you, I can give you, I can set you free from your anxieties. I can set you free um, from that guilt, from that shame. I'm, I'm your hope. I'm your hope for this brand new life. It's, it's Jesus who's on a mission of mercy to set us free. So then he can empower us with his spirit to share his mercy with others, to proclaim that justice has been served. And reconciliation can happen. Oh, Lord, let your presence come. Let your presence come, Lord God. I welcome your presence today. The Holy Spirit was given to empower us to be his, to be his witnesses on a mission of mercy, on a mission of mercy today. We're going we're gonna to take communion this morning. And uh, if you want to get some bread and, and some juice, I've got mine right here. And... Uh, I'm going to share that with you today. When I think about, about this mercy this morning, um, we would not be here if it were not for the, uh, the, the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not here because of anything we've done, but because of all that he has done. The only reason we can, we can let go of things is because of the things that God has let go with us. I remember the first time Get ready to share communion. Um, I remember one time, my wife and I, when we got our first cell phone, we got, had our first cell phone. And I remember um, it was exciting for us because cell phones were new and, and we were blessed by, to be able to get one. And, 
And I remember for the first time, we were, gonna, we were gonna just go a mile away to go have dinner, and we were gonna lift the kids. Sierra would be in charge of the kids, but we had the cell phone. If anything was wrong, we could we'd be able to be right back. We weren't that far. And I remember um, that I empowered my kids with three words. I said, I said, Mom and Dad, we're gonna go out on a date. We're gonna go out to dinner, okay? Now, if, now if anything happens, I have three magical words for you, and, and they are filled with power. And if anything goes wrong between you guys, you guys start fighting, I want you to remember these words. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Because you won't be happy if I have to come back in the middle of dinner to solve this problem. So I want to empower you with these words. Let it go. Let it go. So we take communion today. I'm asking for the Lord to do a work in our hearts today. And maybe for us, there are just some things we need to let go. Maybe there's just some things today we need to let go. The scripture tells us, let me get the, the word here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so I have my bread, I hope you do. The word that we share today. Let the word um, be partaken today spiritually in our hearts. Because it's in communion that we come together as one in relationship to God. It's the Lord that brings us together as one body today. And so as we partake of the bread together, Father, I pray for this bread. I pray you would use use it to nourish us as a people. The road we are on right now is, is long and it's hard. So may your word nourish our spirits. May your word nourish us and empower us for the mission of mercy you've called us upon. May it give us the strength to let it go, to let go of things perhaps we've been holding on to. Let your word set us free from our anxieties, our regrets, Lord God. May your word um, seal in our hearts that justice has been served on the cross to set us free from our sins, Lord God, to set us free from the consequences of our wrongdoings, who we become, Lord. Some of us, we may be calling out, Lord, right now, just change our very nature, Lord, change my heart today. I pray that as we partake of our bread, use it, Lord God, to nourish our spirits, to encourage us, to strengthen us, and even inspire us, Lord, to learn how to give expression to the mercy you've given us, Lord. In Jesus' name, bless this broad, bod, this bread. Bless it to each person here, Lord God, and to your body of believers, we pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen, amen. You can partake of the bread today. The same way he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. The blood reminds us that um, justice was served. Justice was served on the cross. We're all... The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we, we were all headed in the way to death, but God intervened. God intervened by showing mercy. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. His sacrifice was the only sacrifice. It was a sinless sacrifice. His sacrifice was the only sacrifice that could justify, that can bring justification, payment for all the wrongdoing we've ever done. We live in his mercy. When I see... Um, someone praising God because of perhaps something they see God doing through me. I say, it's not me. It's my life's the product of his mercy. I want to walk in that way. This fact, the scripture tells us, um, the Lord told you what is good and what is required of you to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Father, thank you. 
Thank you for your work on the cross. Thank you for your blood. I pray today, Lord God, as we partake of this cup, Lord, we as a, as a people would be empowered, Lord God, by your spirit to be missionaries of your mercy, Lord. Our society needs it right now. Our country needs it. Our cities need it right now, Lord. They need it, Lord God. They need to see you. I pray, Lord God, that as churches are opening, Lord, you would, you would make a way, Lord. I, I pray right now for every empty chair in every church across the country, Lord, that you would fill them with people who need to know you, Lord. That reconciliation would happen like it's never happened before. That revival would be poured out upon our, our country like it's never been poured out before, Lord. Bring healing, bring reconciliation today. I pray for, for physical healing. I pray for um, uh, mental health, Lord God, emotional health, physical health, relational health, Lord God, and spiritual health. May we be reminded who you've called us to be as we partake, Lord, of this, of this cup today, Lord. In Jesus' name. I take a moment, Lord, to pray for those who who may find themselves in a place right now where they know that this is not where they're supposed to be. This is not who you called them to be. And if there's a chasm there today, Lord, I, I pray for those that, that would like to, to move forward at, those, those that are stuck today, Lord, would you extend your mercy to them? Would you, would you do for them what they cannot do for themselves? In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today. We're getting ready to partake of this cup. Maybe you're here today and you need God to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You need God's mercy today to work in your life. I just want you to open your heart to God. Extend your hand to Jesus today. Say, God, I need you to work in my heart today. I have issues. I confess I have issues, Lord. I need you to work in my heart today. I need you to work in my heart today. I need you to make that bridge, Lord. Help me to cross that bridge between where I'm at and where I know you've called me to be. I need you to change my heart, Lord. I need you to fill, my, fill me with your spirit, a fresh filling of your spirit today, Lord. In Jesus' name, In Jesus' name. We enter together, Lord God, as your people. Bless this cup, Lord God. Bless your heart for all who are partaking by faith in Christ today. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's partake of this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're here today. You've never given your heart to Jesus Christ today, um, but he's here. He's here today, and uh, you're gonna find yourself in a place where you're, you're not where you're supposed to be, but you wanna be in the place where you're supposed to be. I wanna invite you to receive Christ today. I wanna give you that opportunity today. And if that's you, I just wanna open your heart. We're gonna pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sins. I confess how my life is messed up. I've blown it so many times, but I believe you were sent by the Father to die for my sins. I believe on this mission of mercy that justice was served on the cross through your death and that you were so rich in mercy that the Father raised you back up to life that we may also live a brand new life. And I believe you're up in heaven, pouring out your spirit on those who receive you. Lord, change my life, change my heart, and help me to live a life that's pleasing to you, and a life that impacts the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer, know that God has began a new work in you. Um, you, you, have, you are set free. You have been forgiven. And I pray that the joy of forgiveness would be sealed in your heart so that you would be able, you would be empowered by the Spirit to give expression to the mercy, to the mercy God has, God has given you. When we give, when we show mercy, we, 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 we show God. We show God's heart. We reveal God's heart. And that's what he's called us to do today. If you've given your heart to Christ, go to ColumbiaLifeChurch.org. Um, Say hello. If you have a prayer request, let us know. I want to be praying for you. Um, I want to be praying. God, we, we need to be praying for one another. And I want to make sure you're, 
you know that you have someone who's praying for you. Um, God's merciful. And let me know how we can be praying for you um, as well. Also, I want to take a moment just to pray for those of, the, those of you, our financial partners, our prayer partners. Um, we could not do this without you. Thank you so much. Um, I say this um, from sincere heart. We could not be doing this without you. And so I want to make sure we pray for the offering today and, and God's blessing. And because that's, that's also a gift of his mercy. Um, everything we have, everything we are comes from him. We, we recognize our, who our supply comes from. And so let's just take a moment to pray for those and ask God's blessing for one another today. Um, Father, we thank you today. We, we take an opportunity to pray for the offering today. Those that are giving on, online, um, Father, I, we love you. And, and just today, Lord, we, we recognize that, that out of your mercy, that everything we have, everything about us, who we are, what we have, it all comes from you. It's, it's a gift of your mercy. You've been merciful to us, Lord. And so I pray uh, in an act of mercy, Lord, you continue to be gracious and merciful to your people as they, as they sow seed, Lord, into your kingdom. As, as we are believing, Lord, for um, a, a, a manifestation of mercy across the country, Lord, um, Bless them, Lord God. Bless them in the area of finances right now. Even as the economy is, is navigating through, through interesting times, Lord God, I pray you just bless your people as they sow seeds so they can continue to be a blessing in the lives of others, Lord. We pray, Lord, bring healing to our country, Lord, healing to relationships. And uh, we give these things to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Bless you. And uh, hey, we love you guys. Again, let us know if there's anything we can be doing to... Uh, uh, be praying for you to serve you. You can always contact us at columbialifechurch.org. Make sure to stop by. Say hello. Know we're praying with you. And, uh, and we, we love you guys. I hope you have a great Sunday. Have a great week. God bless you.